All right. With great data comes even greater access latency. Welcome to the Presto Community Broadcast, where we transform your latency woes into fast insights. I'm your co-host, Brian Olson. And I'm your co-host, Manfred Moser. <laughs> Presto Community Broadcast is a show host a show where we cover events and happenings in the open source Presto community and show off some cool stuff about Presto. And we also forget to turn our marks our mics on sometimes. <laughs> uh, and uh, today we actually have uh, Corey Darby uh, joining us. Welcome, Corey. We'll be hearing more from him in uh, just a little bit. Um, and uh, so uh, basically uh, cover a little bit about uh, Manfred's training course, a couple highlights, some events, uh, new happenings going on in the community. Um, this week, our concept of the week is going to be Kubernetes. Uh, and so we're going to dive in a little bit on uh, how Kubernetes is actually being used with Presto and, uh, and particularly how uh, it's being used at uh, 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 Blue Cat at where Corey works. Um, then uh, I'll be jumping into a PR of the week. It's actually a, a pull request that I did a while back uh, on the Elasticsearch connector, um, be covering basically how this uh, connector or basically this piece is being used uh, to uh, broaden the types because there's a uh, kind of a strange uh, thing in the Elasticsearch, basically the Elasticsearch data model that uh, brought up an interesting use case for arrays. So we'll cover that. And then finally, question of the week uh, is uh, kind of what to do when your web UI says disabled. Uh, this is a pretty common uh, sticky problem that happens when you're uh, moving your Presto cluster to HTTPS. So uh, get going to cover that and uh, um, then that will be it for the show. So uh, before we hop into all that, uh, let's go uh, to a quick word from our sponsors, uh, Starburst. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Starburst, for hosting this show. Starburst is an enterprise offering that builds upon open source Presto distribution. The main vectors you improve upon when moving to Starburst are performance, support, and simplicity to deploy. The performance gains come from an enterprise suite of Presto connectors that improve upon the open source connectors by offering parallel implementations and improved statistics exposed to the cost space optimizer. There are also connectors that don't exist in the open source projects, such as the Snowflake connector and Delta Lake connector, and many other that prove useful in many enterprise applications. My favorite thing that Starburst offers is how they take away the pain of deployment, deployment, security, and scaling your Presto cluster up by offering Kubernetes deployments on multiple cloud platforms. This relieves a lot of pressure from your ops team and offers them a slick user interface called Mission Control that makes the management of your cross-platform clusters easy. Finally, they have a team of experts that are available to address any issues you experience. This team includes the original founders of Presto, a dedicated customer success team, and even Manfred and myself. We clearly think the product is great, but don't take our word for it. Try Presto for free. Head on over to starburstdata.com to learn more. And now back to the show. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to bring up uh, your recent post, uh, Manfred. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on with this Presto First Steps course? Uh, this time with my microphone also yes, muted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Double unmute. Slowly but surely, we'll get the, so, the information So this out. Press the First Steps is a follow-up uh, to Press to the Definitive Guide, the book that I wrote with Matt, Matt and Martin early this year. And it's basically a beginner training course um, that we are working on uh, or I'm working on together with O'Reilly. It's using their online uh, live training platform called Carta Coda, where you basically without having to do anything yourself on your workstation, you can log in on a browser and start hacking around. And so it has those live examples. And it's a three hour class and I'll be teaching you basically from not knowing about Presto to having it running, having the CLI connected, having some other tool connected, uh, running queries with it, connecting data sources and all that kind of stuff and give you a good overview, be available for questions and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's available on O'Reilly. It's going to be the first time on the 16th of November. There's another one scheduled for sometime in January. I'm not even sure the date. And um, lots more information is available there on the O'Reilly website, uh, learning.oreilly.com. And I'm writing a blog post for prestosql.io, so you will be able to find the links there as well. In the meantime, you can go to simplegility.com. All right. Uh, glad you covered that. And uh, yeah, I mean, we'll... Uh, the basic idea for, for these last two releases uh, that we had covered before was that uh, 
uh, basically that release 342 and 343 uh, were essentially a part of the same release. There was a bug that uh, uh, went out with 342. So uh, that was basically uh, fixed in 343. And so now that we are on... Uh, we basically, if you are trying to go to the latest version, skip 342 and go to 343. And that was essentially the summary of, of what we're covering in the release. Do you want to say anything else, Manfred, before we move along? No, I think just like as usual, it was a, a miscellaneous uh, selection of cross-cutting uh, improvements, lots of them in imp improvements in terms of performance. Corey already mentioned that he really wanted to adopt that version before some uh, things that affected him. And uh, there's also a couple of other changes for the timestamp treatment and others. But just check out the release notes. And also, by the way, 344 is coming in around the corner too. We're planning towards that as well. The release channel is already, let's get another one ready. So awesome. So happening. Okay, cool. Um, so next thing I'm going to do is highlight a couple uh, things that we have going on in our from the Presto newsletter. Um, I will be adding the link to if you want to subscribe to the Presto newsletter in the show notes. Uh, that uh, is just basically going on to the through the website and uh, subscribing there. But they have cool content like this. So uh, right now I, uh, we're talking Presto at uh, PostgresConf, uh, which is basically an ongoing set of uh, of of, of um, uh, instructions or, ba or, uh, courses, not courses, but basically, uh, uh, lectures. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of it's kind of initially based around Postgres, but it's not exclusively just a Postgres only thing. And so this, uh, for, there was a uh, talk that's already been given. So I'll be linking this, uh, talk, uh, called creating a single point of access to multiple Postgres servers using Starburst Presso. Uh, this was given by Randy Chertko. And he, uh, he basically just kind of goes through a very similar setup of, of what Manfred's going to be covering, but more specifically geared towards, you know, maybe a more intermediate or advanced Presto user that uh, will, be, will be setting up all of the configurations and kind of everything you would need to know to kind of do a federated uh, query over multiple databases. And in this particular one, he's, he's doing it over multiple uh, RDBMSs, but uh, there is a future one, uh, and I'll... Let me see if I can pull that one up real fast. Uh, again, these will all be in the show notes for anybody listening on the blog, but um, this, this one's coming up. It's the unlock data in Postgres servers to query it with other data sources like Hive, Kafka, other DABMSs, and more. And so it sounds like he's going to be diving into other use cases with more federated query uh, stuff. And so it's, it's all going to be kind of showcasing how Presto can kind of can kind of act as a single source for a lot of your uh, various data sources. So uh, I think he did a really good job. It was uh, on the on the uh, all RDBMS one. Uh, it's pretty pretty useful how he goes over it and kind of gets into some of the nooks and crannies of uh, things that people tend to miss. So uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, those will be linked in the show notes. Um, let's see what else do we got here. We have yeah. Yeah, I, I, I even he covered a couple of things that I had actually kind of uh, uh, not not known knew about in terms of the the security aspects. I'm I always just jump in and start putting things together, and you know, security is kind of I'm that typical engineer that just puts security in the second <laughs> part of my mind. And so, uh, so he he covered a couple of security aspects that I hadn't I wasn't thinking about. Um, so I also wanted to cover this. Uh, there's a, a blog post called Presto Fa uh, and Fast Objects, uh, putting backups for use of DevOps and machine learning. Uh, this is a, a Medium post by Joshua Robinson. He is covering ba basically kind of uh, covering Presto from uh, from the aspect of, you know, different use cases that you can use uh, uh, the Presto service for. Like a lot of people typically just go straight to uh, uh, replacing the Hive engine a lot of times. Some people will focus more on federated queries, but but he covers it uh, on on more particular use cases. Uh, one he calls the rapid restore scenarios, where if you let's say have a prod and, uh, uh, version of your data run, uh, up and running, and let's say you it gets corrupted or something something really bad happens, you can use Presto to quickly do a CTAS and just basically move in a, the copy of, of the subset of data that, that, got, uh, that basically got, uh, 
got corrupted. And so uh, that's one uh, interesting use case that you could use for it there. Um, and and he uses he talks about it's basically this use case reiterated on on various contexts. So then he kind of goes into like in machine learning, a lot of times you're doing a lot of A B testing and you're going through uh, a lot of different times where you need to basically spin up a, a random environment very quickly, especially if you're pulling from multiple sources, right? So a lot of machine learning use cases, they usually touch data from like different divisions of the company, right? So you're usually pulling from Hive, or you're pulling from MySQL, you're pulling from all sorts of uh, parts of your organization. And so when you when you have to replicate that data really fast, and you know, you're trying to target specific areas, like that would take a lot of ETL type magic or Python scripting to basically get all that stuff pulled together. And, and it basically just, you know, you set up Presto and autom automatically you, you have something where you can just pull from these different systems, run a quick SQL C task query and boom, it's there. So, so yeah, definitely really powerful stuff here. He, he, and he talks about all the different contexts where you see it and they in particular are using, um, uh, Spark for their ML library. So uh, they what's really useful is that Spark, you know, also operates on a lot of the same open source files like Orc and Parquet. So as soon as, you know, anything that that uh, Presto generates, like, you know, basically spits out some Orc file, then, you know, if you're wanting to run some machine learning use case on it, Spark ML can just immediately, you know, suck that up and then start start processing on it. So so pretty cool, uh, pretty cool article here, I thought, um, that kind of takes that same use case and kind of uh, reiterates on it a couple times. Uh, but, you know, definitely very powerful stuff um so cool uh um so big news uh, for for uh, us at starburst anyways uh we have finally the fourth uh co-creator of and, and one of the original members of of the presto team joining starburst uh and later on this month so uh eric Kwong, for those of you who have been in the community for a while that are familiar with uh martin dane and david uh a lot of people think sometimes that it was just the three of them that that started on the presto team and actually there were uh four original members so uh uh, Eric was uh, was there in the early days back in uh, 2012, uh, getting things started off, and so um, he eventually moved to uh, Portal, right? I think face the Facebook Portal group uh, team, and and so that was the uh, kind of um, video interfacing uh, in your house kind of kind of uh, uh, team. I have no clue to be honest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's basically Alexa for Facebook, <laughs> and so okay. uh, one of those Alexa devices with the video. So um, so yeah, uh, basically he was working on the portal uh, team uh, up until this time, and so recently we uh, had some conversations with him and wanted to get the band back together. And so we, we, uh, got him, uh, up and running. And so, uh, we will be, uh, joining with him and I'm really excited about that, be uh, adding him on as, uh, have his kind of background and, and understanding of the early days of Presto and hopefully, uh, kind of, uh, helps us rethink how we've, how we've done things. You'll have like a, fr uh, kind of a fresh take, but then, you know, with some very heavy context of how things were started. So, so definitely interested on, in, uh, how that's, uh, going to go. Uh, moving forward. A couple events that are coming up. Uh, I'm just going to kind of list these out. We we have uh, the uh, Tech Talk Summits, uh, one in Portland. That's going to be October 8th. Uh, it's going to be at 5 p.m. Uh, through 6.30 p.m. Uh, in Eastern Time. Uh, that's going to have Justin Borgman. He is going to be talking about uh, the overview of Presto. And so it may be a good thing if you're trying to get your company on board to understand how uh, Presto, in particular, how Starburst Presto uh, is kind of revolutionizing a lot of the data analytics, then this will be a good talk to go to. Um, we, there's also going to be a couple talks going on at Big Data ATL. That's going to be October 13th uh, at 6.15 through 7.45. Uh, and then we also have on the same day uh, earlier, actually, that's earlier in the day, another virtual, um, if you missed the first uh, uh, Tech Talk Summit, there's another one uh, going on in Minneapolis. Of course, all of these are are going to be virtual, so it doesn't really matter. So these are this one's going to be uh, October 13th, uh, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And then uh, finally, the last event that we're going to be talking about is going to be to do with Corey. And hopefully now we're going to be able to actually hear you. So good thing we got that, oh, uh, <laughs> that we got that check going before we had you promote this. So mm -hmm. let me actually pull up uh, this meeting. And Corey, uh, while I pull this up, why don't you introduce yourself and kind of yep. talk a little bit about uh, uh, where you work and how you guys use Press a little 
little bit about how you guys use Presto. Don't sure. n- not the Kubernetes stuff quite yet. No. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm Corey Darby. Uh, you know, I'm a principal software developer at Blue Cat Networks. Uh, we deal with essentially running DNS servers um, and everything related to DNS and DDI and all that space. Um, so we're using Presto mainly for our data platform there um, and moving away from this single tenant Elasticsearch per customer kind of scenario to more of this multi-tenant using Presto really to power the whole thing. Mm. Um, so we have um, machine learning using Presto. We have some batch stuff using Presto. We have ad hoc, uh, ad hoc queries or it's a transition. So some of this is in the phase of happening and some of it isn't there, but we're getting there. Sure. Um, so, but yeah, really Presto is a big player um, for us now. So what made you guys decide to move to Presto? I'm just curious. Um, so a lot of it was the flexibility, um, mainly the fact that we had our current setup was something like, okay, so we're in AWS and it's a cloud and we're using S3. And then we have something to take the data from S3 to say Elasticsearch. And Presto really fit well going, okay, so we have two paths here. We can use Elasticsearch connector, or we can just use um, S3 connector and just have the data right away. There wasn't this huge um, migration thing where it was like, well, how are we going to move data in? And now we have to have a pipeline to read the data out and pull it into this other tool. It was, we spun up the cluster and essentially was like, okay, point to S3 and we're kind of good to go. (laughs) Um, So at least for like proof of concept, it was really easy to prove like this will work. Yeah. And there's not a ton of development capacity. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that's the most valuable thing a company has. It's not the money. It's nothing else. It's dev time. Yep. Because it's so finite. Um, so for us, it was just very straightforward and simple to get a proof of concept. And then it was like, all right, we're sold. Like it meets the requirements. Let's move forward. Yeah. Awesome. So it's, it's good to hear that you're using the elastic search connector because that's gotten so we're lots not of using improvements. the elastic search connector actually. So oh. it was one option, but the, uh, hive connector with the S3 stuff worked perfect for us. Okay. So we, we didn't even need, um, to go down that path. And there's more stuff of why we chose it, which is um, you support the IAM security policies, oh, yeah, yeah. the S3 Hive stuff. So this is important for us to um, be able to lock down per customer data and stuff like this. Mm, nice. Um, so, you know, one of the things we looked at was, you know, the last search connector is fine, but now we're gonna have to write some sort of custom authenticator to lock down which cluster we're going to, mm. because for us, it's single tenant um, going to a multi-tenant. So we have many Elastic searches going to just one Presto. And then it was going to be, well, how do we tell which customer is supposed to go to which cluster and all this uh, versus on the S3 stuff, you know, our plan is just to write a custom JWT authenticator and look in the custom payload and just use that to map the group. And then with right. IAM policies, we lock based off of that. So the customer can't leave their bucket. I, I, when you send in the query and their group is, you know, customer one, two, three. We just associate that to bucket one, two, three, and that's it. You you don't actually get to see any of the other data. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it uh, was some of the reasons why we looked at it. Very cool. Yeah, it's it's great to see that, and I I really think that in particular, uh, just that when you were saying the proof of concept stuff, like it, that's one of the best things. Is like all these. I'm not going to say who, but there's a lot of companies that are basically requiring you, hey, before you actually use our stuff, we need you to kind of upfront migrate some of your data or at least copy it, you know, just to get it get it in there. And before we can show you any really real value there uh, and, and how this is going to work within your actual architecture, you have to do all this stuff. With Presto, that just doesn't exist. You can, you can just spin up a couple, I mean, the, the only thing you're paying is maybe a couple days, uh, and, or and not even a couple days, like <laughs> I'm usually depending on, on what your setup is going to be and what your proof of concept is, but it could be, you know, a couple hours to a couple days and, uh, you spin up, you know, the, a uh, couple nodes and then just start running a couple queries. It's, it's that simple, yeah. no data migration, nothing that you're waiting on. And there, there was some other things, um, which was, you know, we're, we're using Pulsar, and for those unfamiliar, it's, it's somewhat similar to Kafka. Mm-hmm. And it was the fact that, 
you know, we looked at writing, well, Pulsar has a connector actually, and 2.7 release of Pulsar, it supports Presto SQL. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just nice being like, okay, so S3 is our, you know, batch kind of like, that's where everything gets stored long-term. But yeah. what about the real stream stuff? And what about joining that if I want to join the real stream with the stored stuff? And it's like, oh, great. We just have another connector and we can just left join. Um, the other big thing, which was, you know, there's different teams. There's a lot of fuzziness of, well, what happens if we want to have Cassandra for something? No problem. One central spot, SQL, just add the connector and you can left join mm -hmm. as long as we know what data to join on. Like this is very powerful, yep. um, especially for, you know, you know, for Blue Cat's 400 employees and 25% uh, of that is engineering, but these smaller kind of mid-sized companies, they're not used to having this central like, oh, it doesn't matter, there's a connector for that, or we just add a connector, and now anyone in the company can access your data across the boundaries, no yep. matter where it is. Yep. Uh, versus the other tools, it's usually like, no, no, you have to take your data and move it into said tool. Yep. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but that's the hardest thing, because yeah. now I need buy-in on the team, yep. I need dev capacity from the team, and I can't do it myself because you need to understand the inner workings of that. Yeah. Um, and if there's security like, things yep. too, you know, if there's also a potential that you have to run it by your security team uh, or some other, you know, D DevOps team that if you're not in charge of, you know, they don't give you your own your own nodes to play with. So it could be a lot of a lot of upfront thing. I want to pause you right there and, and then uh, point out. So you were talking about mid-sized companies. So uh, I like what you said about that. You know, and a lot of times we hear about Presto in this kind of context of, uh, we net we hear about Netflix and Uber and and you know Facebook is where this this all came from. So uh, you had a really interesting point, and I think you're going to be talking a, a little bit about this in in this uh, event as well. Um, you know why we talk a lot about the big companies uh, that you're you know saying yeah Presto you don't have to have a giant you know. Uh, Fortune 500 company to run Presto, and there's still plenty of use cases for the the middle or little guy, you know. So, uh, uh, yep. elaborate on that a little bit. Thank you for keeping me on track. I actually, the whole point was to talk about the meetup. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, this so, is great. This is great. Yeah, uh, the 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 meetup. You know, and I really appreciate what you know both of you have done with the training and everything, and and perspectives of the larger company, you know, the, the Pinterest and Ubers and Facebook. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times when I talk to other people are like, yeah, but we can't dedicate 20 people just to building out blah. Um, mm -hmm. And the last company I was from was much larger, like 2000 employee company. And now I'm at a 400 employee company. And, you know, the first thing that always comes up with this sort of stuff is how much effort and how much people is a great take. Mm -hmm. And for us, like, honestly, the entire data platform team is not even really five people. It's two full-time people really, and three people on kind of a loan basis where they're needed. So I, I think a two man project to really get something moving to prove its value is pretty justifiable for a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. You know, even if your engineering department's only 50 people, carving out two people for, you know, a three to five month span is doable um, versus a lot of people, I think they see the Uber stuff and you know, I've been at some of the events and you ask them and they're like, yeah, we didn't have a big team. It was like 10 people for eight months. And you're like, yeah, but the, you know, you're asking for like 15% of the entire development capacity of where I work yep, exactly. for eight months. That's, that's not going to fly. Yeah. And that assumes yeah. that, you know, there's no ramp up and there's no problem. So uh, I really want to do a meetup just to show that it, look, you know, even at 400 employees or, you know, engineering size of a hundred even, um, it is totally doable. And I really think this is the right tool kind of to start dipping your feet into the more, the larger data platform stuff. So for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for putting, I mean, that's, that's such a strong uh, message. And I think that more, more people need to hear it because it's, especially within this, you know, Presto community, you're, you're hearing about that constantly. And so, yeah, that, that was definitely a misnomer is like, oh, okay, well, the only way I can really jump into this is that uh, I have to be at one of these bigger companies. So I might as well not even try because my, you know, there's no way my boss is going to sign off on this and, you know, it's just going to take too much upfront. And, and it's really, 
not, you know, when you, once you get into it, it's, it's actually a pretty, a pretty useful tool for, for midsize. And that's actually where, before I, I joined at Starburst, I was working at a cybersecurity company that was a, you know, midsize, about thousand, thousand uh, size uh, uh, employee company. So it, it's definitely something that, uh, you know, is very doable. We had a group of two of us in the very beginning when we first were, were proof of concepting everything. And so it, and uh, we got that up and running in literally a couple of days. And so uh, we just kept going on and on. The only thing that we had to run into was like, you know, we, we also wanted to use the Elasticsearch connector and we, we just had to build out a couple things and that was it, you know? So, so it's definitely uh, approachable and I'm glad that you uh, put this together for that. So definitely, uh, October 19th this is when Corey's going to be giving this talk. Uh, it's going to be a 6 p.m. Uh, at an Eastern time. So uh, I really hope to see a lot of you there. Um, anything else, closing words that you want to say about the, the event? We'll have you in just a second on the concept stuff anyways. But Nope. Just, you know, works really well with the concept stuff. Awesome. So. Cool. cool. Um, okay. Uh, last uh, things on the news, uh, article and we got to get rolling. Cause, uh, we, we did, I I'm really glad we spent some time there just, just kind of, uh, uh getting a really, uh, good understanding of what blue cat's doing, but, um, uh, we got to get going so that we can cover the rest of this ground, uh, before the end of this hour. So, um, couple trainings uh, I will be linking in the show notes uh, from uh, David, Dane, and Martine, uh, basically just the uh, trainings that are covering advanced SQL, uh, various query tuning, Presto security, and uh, also uh, cu a couple knob adjustments for uh, performance and, and things like that that Dane uh, also gave. So uh, these are really nice. Uh, uh, they're two hours long, so a little bit lengthy. We are working on uh, getting these out into a blog format, uh, slowly but surely, but, uh, but in the meantime, these videos are there and I will be linking those in the show notes. Um, other than that, uh, we have the Presto Summit series. Uh, these are uh, the Fortune 500 giant company use cases uh, that we were just talking about. Uh, they, they talk about how they're uh, using their their uh, presto within their company so we have you know zwara uh, arm treasure data and pinterest uh we're a couple just to name a few uh we'll be linking those in the show notes as well and then as well as we'll be covering a couple uh, podcasts uh we have the um one coming from, uh, again, this is kind of a higher level. If you're trying to kind of convince your boss about Presto, uh, there's a, um, uh, a Red Hat uh, series where they're talking about uh, the infrastructure renaissance and how it will power the modernization of analytics platform. Uh, this is going to be, fe this features uh, Matt Fuller. Uh, he's one of the product uh, guys on our team. And he basically just covers how, how Starburst fits within an architecture. Um, and so I think it'll clear a lot of confusion about uh, what Presto is and, and how it's being used. Uh, it's a really super useful podcast uh, that will be linked as well as a uh, Nice one from Contributor. Uh, this one is talking uh, more for engineers uh, wanting to know the history and kind of background of, of Presto. And it's uh, got, you know, Martin, Dane, and David just, just basically talking about the old days and then kind of how things got to uh, where they were today. Um, so with that, uh, that's pretty much the, the news. Let's go on to the concept of the week. Um, so uh, I'm going to give hand this over to Manfred. And today we're talking about Kubernetes. Yeah, um, Kubernetes, uh, what is Kubernetes and why, why should you be worried about it? And more importantly, you probably already know about Kubernetes, but how does that relate to Presto? And Corey is going to give us some practical insight there as well. And uh, keep me honest, maybe as well. I hope, I hope. <laughs> so what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is basically the most commonly used uh, runtime platform and what, what's called a container orchestration platform for running large infrastructure or lots of servers. Um, they're all container-based, typically Docker, but can also be other containers. And it basically manages everything from starting the containers, making sure they're up and running, shutting them down if you're scaling down, DNS routing, all sorts of stuff. Like it, it manages everything for you, basically. And it is you could pretty much consider it the de facto runtime environment for lots and lots of things. Um, of course, if you like need very large servers, you could go to just the older common approach is which is a virtual machine a virtual machine has its own operating system a container doesn't a container shares the operating system which is linux with 
the underlying system, which is virtual machine uh, typically, or even a bare, what's called a bare metal server. But all the user space where your application runs, which is what you really care about, um, is separate in the different containers. So that's where sort of like super, super high level quick overview of Kubernetes. There's lots of tooling, lots to learn, lots of resources out there. Um, the typical use case or very typical and well understood usage for containers is a horizontal scaling with many, many containers. So typically say you have a website, dynamic or static, doesn't really matter. Um, and you want to have, be able to have lots of traffic hit that website. Um, the individual servers that provide the content are stateless. That means if one of them dies, doesn't matter. Uh, and they're very small and lightweight, often provide my web services and are very micro and very small. And that's the very typical use case uh, with, with Kubernetes. And that's what people think about when they go, oh, let's adopt Kubernetes. Um, now I'm gonna shift switch gear over to, is that so, so far right, Corey, in your yeah, opinion? Yeah, I, I, it's just, you know, assuming you're bought into containers like Docker, um, it's really the piece of the puzzle for the management orchestration deployment, uh, making sure everything's running smoothly. So, yeah. Cool. So, so now we have to pivot over to Presto. Presto can totally run on containers. Now, that's where the similarities, however, so to some degree end. Presto also has the idea that it has what's called uh, the coordinator, which is basically the one server that, that is like the orchestrator of everything in a Presto cluster. And then it has the individual workers. The similarities disappear though, when it comes to the typical Kubernetes usage, because a Presto worker, as well as a coordinator, they are typically large machines. They're not small lightweight containers. They are fairly beefy servers. I'm talking 90 gigabyte of memory up to 256 gig, 64 CPUs and more, right? Like really beefy machines. So that's critical. If you think you're just gonna be like throwing a whole bunch of different containers on it, it's not actually efficient. It's better to have less workers in your cluster that are a bit bigger because, and this is the other thing, when Presto uh, works on queries, what it does is it's all in memory distributed across those dis different servers, those workers. And, and that, and that means it's not stateless. I, I was gonna say that this was actually a shocker to me. Um, coming from, you know, this whole cloud and Kubernetes space where it's um, small and many. Yeah. And up until literally, I think two, three weeks ago, when I watched the video from you and Dane talking about optimization, where it was like, uh, you talk about this actually, that Presto, exactly what you're saying is few and large. And this is kind of the contradiction to what most people are used to in the cloud. Yeah. Um, and it makes sense to what you're saying. It's just, if you're running Kubernetes, you're not used to this. You're just like very, very, very small, many. Um, exactly. And you come yeah. over to Presto and it's like, no, 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 few and large. So. And, and like just to, for background, and that's also why I want to bring this up because it's a, it's a common trap people fall into. Now, if you're thinking that's inefficient, you would be wrong. Uh, think of it that way. In, in Kubernetes to scale, everything is on the little containers um, and done via IO. So across the containers in Presto, there's a few big VMs or containers and in those containers run the Java virtual machine. And then all the little workers in the system are basically threads. So it still has the total fine grained many, many workers kind of idea from, from Kubernetes, but they just run within the larger bucket of Presto. And the other important aspect, it's all in memory. There's no disk. IO kind of thing happening, everything is in memory. And that's one of the things why um, Presto is much like very, very fast because it does most of its processing and everything on on memory purely. It doesn't, there's a feature to spill to disk, for example, but typically you want to avoid that actually. You want to just stay in memory and get it all done. And I think you and Dane talked about, uh, I think it was called SKUs. Was it called SKUs? Yeah, it's SKUs. When yeah. You, so I was going to say that essentially, you know, you, you have a large chunk of work, go to the small little 
container that you're running might get overwhelmed versus these larger ones, it's not likely to happen. I, I think that video that you and Dane had was really, really, really good on this stuff. Yeah. It was even eye-opening to me where it was like, wow, okay. Yeah, no, Dane was was definitely rocking that one and explained a lot of things. We had a whole bunch of like prim like preparatory sessions where we're like discussing these things. And like that's one of the things that came up to me. And so I thought I'll I'll explain it. So so now let's shift over to to your Kubernetes use. Are you using Kubernetes in your system, Corey? So yeah, we are using Kubernetes. Uh, we are in Amazon. We're using the managed Kubernetes service called EKS. Um, so we don't actually run our own Kubernetes cluster. We push off the responsibility. That's very typical, right? Like, I mean, yeah. Kubernetes, and that's one of the other things. Kubernetes is not a simple software. It is very, very complex. It has lots of knobs to turn and things to mess up and things to keep, you know, so yeah, well, using one of those systems. The managed good. services just take away the most important thing, which is like, you know, the control plane is working. Yeah, because exactly. if the control plane is working, I can't manage anything. So that has to be working 24 7, 365, like no problem. Um, yeah. Everything else, you're like, okay, if my little, um, you know, uh, Kubernetes calls it pod. Um, so if my, my pod is down, you know, it's all right. It's not the end of the world. Kubernetes will clean it up as long as the, or fix it as long as the control plane is running. But the control plane is not running, you're in trouble. So exactly. uh, we do run Presto on Kubernetes, and we are using Helm charts actually for this. Um, so Helm chart for those unfamiliar is kind of like your package installer of Kubernetes. So you basically define uh, the Kubernetes components and how you want it to be installed and it allows it to be reproducible. Um, if you're from Linux world, it's kind of similar to the concept of like app get install, but for Kubernetes stuff. So you, yeah. you know, you just Helm install um, Presto and that's it. Presto is now running in your cluster. Um, minus adding the connectors and other configuration that you would want to do. Um, but yeah, so that's how we run it. And we're using S3 as um, you know the Hive connector in S3. So, so you run a, a fairly large cluster or just like a dozen machines? Or... Fair, because we're in this transition, it's very, very small stuff. They're just like, um, you know, really it's like four or five, yeah, or x cool. largest like it's actually really small like um for... but that's it that's important to understand right you don't have to have these massive machines and like a hundred or a thousand of them you can start with like you know a coordinator and a, and a couple of workers and and you can already get a lot done basically and you know you you can scale up to whatever you want and uh you know the reason why we're really using kubernetes with this stuff is you know i was just talking to a colleague today about how we're going to break up um say two different clusters of Presto. Let's say for one for ad hoc stuff and more one for our reporting stuff. Um, and having this pool of resources where your hardware itself is a pool. So let's say we have 10 machines, but now the different clusters we can just shift. So we could say, okay, seven of these nodes are now for ad hoc stuff and three is for the reporting Presto cluster. And you know when the traffic goes down, we can move more over we can switch. Um, so it makes it really fluid with this. Like with VM stuff, I guess you could build tooling around this and some sort of operational tools to do it. But Kubernetes, we just set a auto scale policy and this happens behind the scenes. So there's no human intervention intervention uh, required at all. So. Yeah, very nice. That's super cool. Yeah, I I was on mute. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, that's that's uh, and, and another good point is like I was just gonna say you know when you were saying like well it's like basically not not that big. Uh, I like in my mind and this is I know so little I know enough about uh, uh, Kubernetes in that I'm just coming from Docker and I know that it's taking over uh, some of these kind of uh, management use cases that uh, Docker didn't initially cover and so. I just know that like the whole point is to start out s as small as possible and you don't ha no longer have to really manage and operate how that scales. And so the whole point is that you start at some small, small, uh, use case and then you, you know, you grow as you need anyway. Yeah, so you build upon it. Like for us, like right now we haven't fully transitioned our workload over to Presto. So it's just mostly these very small edge cases while we're figuring out the rest of our infrastructure and everything. Yep. So we're in the small cluster, but, once everything transitions over those, 
you know, four R five, four X large, whatever they are, become like a hundred. Yep. You know, it's really that kind of magnitude, but it's all in place that you know we just go in and um, kubectl deployment dash dash scale replicas a hundred. That's it. Okay. Assuming that we have the nodes there to support that many of them being spun up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and you know, I just want to because I don't think we talk about enough about this in the community. It's so if you're using something like the cloud and you're using the managed service, like it takes 15 minutes to set up and that's the time it mostly takes for the cluster to start up mm -hmm. in Kubernetes. And then I join it and I really run just Helm install Presto and I add a connector and I'm, I'm ready to go. Like that, that's the extent of the setup. There, there's nothing else behind here. There's no like go in and do a bunch of this management stuff or you know, you need to have custom machines or something. So it was really straightforward to get us a POC working. Cool. Yeah, we should definitely at some point, I think on the show, dive a little more into like a simple, a simple set of cases, or it may not even be on this particular broadcast, but we should we should do some uh some uh, toying around where we do not uh, like a like a demo on on this kind of thing. I think it'll be really neat. So, awesome. Uh, well, uh, Manfred, did you uh, have any other questions for Corey before we move on? Probably have another two hours worth of we questions. We could, but yeah. I think we... <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, let's let's then move on to the uh, PR of the week. Um, uh, Corey, yeah, feel free. Please stick around if you if you have the time. Uh, and if anybody asks any questions, Manfred, you can uh, uh, stop me at any point, and we can uh, we can uh, uh, filter those up. So um, uh, this week's PR of the week uh, is one that uh, I actually did a while a couple months ago. Um, and this is uh, actually related to the Elasticsearch connector. Um, so let me move real fast to show this. There we go. Um, so the title of this is just add array object support for Elasticsearch connector via the meta field mapping. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, how Elasticsearch works, um, you Elasticsearch kind of holds, uh, typically works on, a, is, is in some ways you can call it a document store. So it stores uh, just various JSON documents and uh, it's going to build these indexes uh, and call the inverted and inverted index um, at the really uh, core of, of of what it does, it, and it will basically build up an index on every single field that that you see across a particular um, uh, index that you create. And so, uh, when I say index too, that's that's also another one of these strange words in Elasticsearch that actually means more of a um, it's kind of an instance of, of one of your, uh, uh, schemas. So, or you could think of it as like kind of a, an instance of a database, uh, and they call it an index, but it's, uh, just one of those kind of terminology, uh, mappings that you'll have to do. So when I, uh, when I set up an index in Elasticsearch, um, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll set it up and I'll say roughly, these are the, you know, I, I would provide a mapping to it that uh, acts as a schema. And this mapping is, is basically just saying, I, I'm going to be giving you these JSON documents um, and it's going to have roughly this, this schema. And it'll have, you know, numbers at the, you know, this uh, field A that's going to have numbers be, you know, integers, this field B that's going to be an object and, and all these other uh, things that you'll expect to see in the documents being inserted into it. And you can make it such that it's it strictly only allows those documents or it will only index if those fields exist and it'll allow, you know, any unstructured document. Typically, I think most people, I would, I would assume that are using Elasticsearch will have uh, uh, most of their uh, document in a strict map mapping so that they have a uh, schema that they are, you know, strictly adhering to. So, so anyways, so we have these schemas and, and, uh, and these, uh, these schemas called mappings that, uh, that are sitting in Elasticsearch. And so what Presto does in the Elasticsearch connector is it will go through, use this mapping to kind of determine when it's uh, scanning over uh, a particular index uh, and we'll say, okay, you know, I'm uh, practically looking at a table at, at this point. So what am I expecting to, to be the columns of this table? So it'll go out to this mapping and, and search through it. Now, unfortunately, uh, in Elasticsearch, 
the way that they've modeled their arrays, there's no uh, explicit array type because every single field can act as a as a scalar or as uh, as a uh, as an array type uh, and can have you know uh, anything. So if you basically if I say I have this field A of type number, it, you can make you can insert a field uh, basically a number that's just a number let's say one two three. Or you can actually have an array that you insert for that same field, and it's still perfectly acceptable by, by Elasticsearch syntax to say, okay, now I have this array of one, two, three, and then another uh, number, four, five, six, or an empty array, which is equivalent to just null. Um, so, so all, all of these, uh, uh, this kind of like, uh, you know, ambiguity that uh, is kind of inter inherent in the Elasticsearch model uh, is, is, uh, you know, largely due to the fact that it's it's uh, how how they represent their internal index structure, and we won't get into that today. But um, but basically, you you can't uh, Presto has no way of knowing inherently by just looking at the, the this um, this schema or this mapping to know hey this is an array type. So I have to basically provide some extra information somewhere that uh, to to say hey the field in this particular location, we will always uh, adhere to keeping this an array, or if it's basically not an array, you know, then, then we can just ignore it. So, so where we actually put this, um, there's a convenient field called underscore meta inside of Elasticsearch mappings. And this will be per this, this, each of these mappings exists per index. So think of it as like per table. Uh, and so you can make this this meta field that you create that will can, that will hold uh, basically a a um, you can think of it as a as a meta mapping of where these arrays are expected within your within your da uh, data model. So if you have let's say an object that contains an uh, an object A that contains another object B that contains a, a, a number. Um, within that called, let's so call that C. So A contains object B contains C, which is just a number. So in Elasticsearch, that could be either a number or that could be an array. So within this meta field, all you have to do now with this PR is you uh, insert a uh, you insert in this meta a a uh, equivalent, um, uh, and this is going to be hard to kind of articulate in words. So I will be linking this in the show notes uh, for, for those that are listening on the podcast. But you, you have an equivalent nesting of, of objects within your model, within your JSON object that you're expecting to get. And you say specifically within the object that I'm expecting to be an array. So let's say it's A uh, is an object that holds B that holds let's say C or in, in the example I'm giving I use Y but for listeners minds they'll I want to keep it as simple as possible so let's say C can be an array you basically would just have this tag field that says is array and you set the boolean to that to be true and so what Presto will do from that point is say okay I will now expect that A the the uh, field a dot b dot c or a dot b dot y in the example I'm pointing at in, in real life uh, is actually going to be an array. So when I parse it, I'm going to expect to pull that out as not just a scalar value. I'm going to actually be pulling out uh, an array full of numbers. Um, it could even be an empty array, but it's as long as it's something. Now, if I see a single value there, I'm just going to make it an array of, of one. Or if I see nothing there, then I'm just going to basically just pull, pull an empty array. But that just gives Presto the ability to now uh, not have some type error that, that used to come up before. And now you can actually say, hey, I'm expecting to have uh, arrays here, whereas before we had no way of, of, of parsing that uh, information. So it uh, was pretty useful. It was a really fun thing that we had to do. And this was actually one of the use cases that we had to clear up before we could actually use uh, go forward with using the Elasticsearch connector. So uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, is there any questions that came through on the chat about that? Or, or uh, Manfred, do you? Or, no, there's or, no questions. Or... No, no questions on the chat, but um, I, th I find it very interesting that you know, like this kind of lack of schema in 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 Elasticsearch, and like what's always written down is like the big advantage of these <laughs> document database systems mm -hmm. ends up haunting them when you do need that sort of information, and then you have yeah. to have like 
workarounds like that, which is kind of kind of funny, <laughs> ironic yeah. in a way, but also totally makes sense. It's a great implementation. I know that Martina has also been working on a whole bunch of other Elasticsearch connectors in the last couple of months. So it's gotten very solid thanks to your and other contributions. So yep, cool. definitely. It's it's definitely a, uh, that connector is definitely one that is still, you know, kind of growing and I would say in a growing phase. And so, you know, a lot, it fits a lot of the use cases for, for very easy, like low level use cases. Uh, if you just need to basically connect and pull data out. And there are some also cool features that, that Martin's added where it's like the, he, he exposes some search capabilities, some queries like uh like on the actual uh elastic search search uh capabilities that that uh, has been exposed through uh various sql hints and so uh so that's pretty neat as well but but yeah it's it's definitely kind of uh if you're going for really specific use cases in elastic search uh you know you'll have to do a couple probably uh uh updates or changes but definitely check it out it's a really it's a really fun connector to play with and uh, and use especially because it's just hard to map that document uh type of of schema and especially with this inverted but, index to to a presto table you know it's just like yeah but the problem. cool thing like what i find so amazing is is that it actually does that like yeah. out of the box it's smart enough to unroll and unwrap all those documents into a table like structure so you don't actually have to do anything. You can just literally connect it to your storage. And if your documents that you store are sort of uniform, mm -hmm. Presto will automatically create the table schema, so to speak, yep. for that. And when you query it from SQL, it looks like tables. Like yeah. you might not, like you have no idea that you're mucking around in a, on some JSON documents and traversing down the tree structure. It doesn't look like that at all from the user's perspective. And that's oh, pretty yeah. amazing. And of course, also it, it allows you to pipe in like the Elasticsearch queries as well, if you really, really need to. And it also does the whole parallelization, which is kind of cool, right? Like yep. it talks to all the nodes in an Elasticsearch cluster and breaks it up into parallel kind of requests and that kind of stuff. So yeah, you're not bottlenecked really through one one node. Oh, I mean, it's definitely come, come along very far, but I do know that like uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, certain certain uh, areas that, you know, like a particular, uh, there there are some types that weren't supported. Those recently got supported, but uh, I think, I'm trying to remember there was a few other gotchas, but for the most part, yeah, it's a pretty solid connector and it's getting to that, that more, slightly more uh, uh, fleshed out phase. For sure. And what, so, do, what, what do you think, Corey? Do we hear that uh, Brian is going to bring us a pull request, a new one at some stage? Maybe. <laughs> I, it sounds I, like he wants to. I think he's itching to get into that again. <laughs> I do. I think I want to. Well, I think the part that I really want to get into is the push down. Like we haven't done enough with push down predicates in the last search. So that's definitely, the, I think, the next phase that I, I want to start talking, uh, striking up some conversations with Martin shortly. So. Is <laughs> is there any way on the Elasticsearch connector to influence the queries um, for each Elasticsearch index? Like one of the scenarios I thought of was a lot of companies usually have a bunch of different indexes for different reasons. Yeah. Um, but you might want to influence that. Like say, I, for me, it's like, okay, a user logs in. Based off their group, I want to say that that's going to be the index that they search on. Yeah. Yep. So this, I don't know. You can do that. Uh, so actually, uh, Martin added the aliasing uh, uh, ah. capabilities uh, a while back. And so you can, uh, there are, and then the, this is, comes with a caveat. There is some uh, limitations to uh, <laughs> how how this works with like the certain star capabilities that, that Elasticsearch has. So it's not entirely uh, done transparently to where it's like, if you were to use some sort of star capability in uh, in Elasticsearch, where you're covering, you know, ABC index star, you know, uh, yep. we we don't quite have that that fully fleshed out. But you can, I think, provide a list, a very explicit list, and so you might have a giant list. And and I I think there may be some issues in, in that, but there 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 is some limitations there. But it is possible to some to some degree to to be able also to also keep in mind keep in mind also. That's kind of contrary to what like Presto should be doing, right? Like it should just hide all these like low level yeah. mess knowledge that like from but you. You always have someone who has the edge case where yeah, they're trying to migrate. <laughs> they're trying to 
migrate and they're like ah but i want to use presto on my existing system to get me to something else i mean so, it's yeah. the same way that you know you can't fully execute a last an elastic search query like an, a, a true search query without kind of bending the rules of sql and so you do it through kind of these hints right and that's the only kind of way that you can i, I can see now i i am this is one other thing i've i've wanted to look at is like uh, elastic search themselves has some sort of sql system i'm assuming that it's not following ansi so, uh, so in that case, I'm imagining they've bent the rules a lot so that they could, you know, fo follow along their query DSL model. But, uh, but I would be interested to kind of see what they're doing and see if that's if that somehow, you know, we could kind of borrow uh, some of the the ways that they've modeled SQL to uh, to actually query some of our stuff as well. So that's that's all all you know in the ground of of things that would be interesting to check out. Um, definitely. So, um, anyways, in the interest of time, I have to move on because I could talk about this forever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we have a feeling. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So I wanted to then move on to the uh, uh, question of the week. Uh, and this is, yet again, we, we ha are still kind of hoping that everybody can start contributing questions uh, directly to us. But we are uh, pulling a lot of these questions uh, from Slack that are very common questions that we're, we're receiving. So, um, so this particular question is... Um, is why does the web UI uh, say disabled? So this is actually a slide from Dane's recent training uh, that I literally just pulled from YouTube uh, a second ago. Um, so uh, if you are uh, seeing this web interface is disabled uh, screen, what the heck is going on? And so, um, so Dane actually covers this pretty well uh, in the middle of his uh, security training. So that is yet again, uh, will be linked in the show notes uh, in securing Presto uh, training. Um, but uh, if you want to just get the skinny on, on what the answer to this question is, it's basically like once you go in and set up authentication, you, you set up your encryption, you set up your authentication, um, and then you try to go and uh, access your web, web UI, um, you see this thing. And so what's actually going on is you're trying to uh, hit it using HTTP and you ha have already set up HTTPS and this is automatically disabled for uh, a couple security reasons in particular you just you usually just want to be uh, once you have HTTPS why would you want to avoid using you know make, verifying that that uh, the the coordinator that you're actually talking to the correct either coordinator or proxy that that will eventually talk to Presto so so that is definitely uh, kind of one of those things that uh, was was a kind of an initial discussion, but I think it was around three thirty. Oh, it was one of the three thirties uh, that it came out, and we we basically started to make it where you can no longer not only pass over a password uh, in the whenever you have authentication set up, or sorry, when you have H just HTTP, but then once you have HTTPS set up, we're just going to totally disable HTTP and just kind of take that all, all out of the, the possibility, possibility of things that people can uh, still try to access through, through uh, Presto. Because once you have authentication set up, why do it any other way? Um, is kind of the, I think the logical argument there. So, um, there is a escape hatch and I didn't look that up before the show today, but, um, if you are curious about the escape hatch, it's in the, um, uh, it's in the docs to basically re-enable HTTP. If you have maybe a set of users or maybe just a, you're running test in, internal tests or something behind a, a VPN or something, and you still want HTTP to be exposed, you can definitely s set that up uh, and and just you know uh, re-enable the HTTP to to work again. But it's it's definitely not something that we recommend from a security standpoint. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show, and this is actually a problem I ran into recently, and uh, Manfred actually pointed me out to this because he had just done the uh, securing Presto uh, uh, video just recently before that um i was actually using a proxy um there's a there's a kind of second iteration on this where once i've set up https if you use a proxy you have to also set this um this uh h this uh property called http dash server dot process dash forwarded equals true so by default, it's set to false. And what this enables you to do is it enables you to run Presto to expect that a that you are going to be getting a um, 
a, a header, a security header that's forwarded to you from uh, a from a proxy instead of directly getting this from a client. So, so this uh, is what this particular uh, uh, thing enables you to do this and. I was setting up this uh, this example in Katakoda uh, using this Hive connector, and so I basically open up. Uh, hopefully, this didn't chime out on me. Cool, it didn't. So if I open up Presto UI, um, I, I will see a username field uh, a login, just like I would expect to on an HTTP server service. And then if I try to log in. Uh, and th since this one, by the way, has not set up the uh, encryption or authentication, so I'm not going to expect to see the disabled uh, 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 error message. So, um, but I don't for some reason, you know, now I'm not able to log in. And when I pulled up, uh, I pulled up the uh, exception for this, and it basically had some very kind of uh, gnarly uh, uh, SSL type. Uh, uh, or sorry, not SSL. This one was HTTP. Some uh, Apache HTTP library message that that you know didn't make any sense. Uh, and I gave this to Manfred, and Manfred was like, "Nope, never seen that." But then came to me like the next day and was like, "Oh yeah, this is probably this this uh, server can uh, uh, um, uh, uh, thing." So it's this HTTP dash server. I actually have the same question. It's like I looked it up me asking the question actually just to confirm was the same thing of like, how do I use Presto when it's behind a, like a, a load a balancer? Yeah. yeah. So, because for us, it was like the response would come back, the rest response would come back with the internal address of Presto. Yep. And it was like, uh, I can't access that actually. Yeah. Right? Like there's a, there's a proxy between that. So yep. we get this question. So we, uh, Dane, Dane has like been dying for me to like, uh, work on this question and a couple other like times that we talk about this question, because I think, he just gets this question all the time. So as soon as something like this comes up, I feel like he just gets pinged in, in Slack. So uh, so definitely, you know, this is something I think we're just going to have to repeat ourselves on a lot of times because it's just a common confusion and there's really just no way around it. It's a, it's a we have to have it set up this way because it's it's a security issue if we don't. But then uh, it, it's it's really just one of these funny things that you know maybe we'll, we'll work on trying to. I don't know. It's got. It's is this in the documentation somewhere too, Manfred? Um, we're currently working on revamping or starting to revamp the security section to be more user friendly, based on what um, Dane has sort of like let us know and taught us and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And uh, Barton is working on that at the moment, actually, as we speak. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Hopefully, within the next couple of releases, we'll have that on the site. So, so there's lots if, more coming. Hopefully, if people are watching this or hearing this, then it's you know just look out for that that uh, uh, that particular uh, uh, field or that that uh, property to be set. You'll want to set that to true. And so I'm just gonna uh, run it real fast on this Katakoda example. So this is I thought this was a pretty interesting example just because you know this is not where you're thinking of the proxy term. You're just like oh I'm using this this third part this third party kind of service that's spinning up Presto inside their environment. But this is actually the same exact. Uh, type of uh, proxy problem. So when we, we bring Presto back up and we log back into it, uh, then we can actually um, we can actually now go into the web UI. Just type in any particular username, and now we're we're into the web UI. So so it's it's uh, one of those things that's just kind of tricky, but it's you know and, and it's like one of those necessary evils, I guess, um, in terms of how it's set up. And so, uh, we will be trying to make the documentation a little more clear with that. And, um, you know, definitely give us your feedback. If you have any questions about how to, uh, do that, set up, uh, the, uh, security first, check out Dane's, uh, super, super useful, uh, securing Presto video. Uh, but then if that, uh, doesn't help you, then, uh, definitely reach out to us on Slack. So um, with that, uh, anything else before we start wrapping it up? No, I think that's good. Cool. So if you have a question to submit, uh, or if you especially, please, like if you have a, one of these questions yourself or like a, a PR that you want us to feature on here and you'd like to maybe you know, kind of showcase it a bit and talk about what it does and all this stuff, I don't want to sit here and talk about the PRs that I've done in the past uh, or we'll be sitting here hearing about the Elasticsearch connector every day. So, <laughs> so uh, we, I would definitely want to hear from, uh, from all of you, uh, you know, hear what PRs you've been working on uh, and 
and any questions that you have uh, can be doesn't even have to be super low in the weeds on you know uh, development of Presto it can be something on the data science level or if you're you know trying to connect something to Presto we we want to get your questions so uh, reach out to us on Slack. Um, we will have all the links to that in the show notes. Uh, and then uh, hit us up on the channel presto-community-broadcast there. Otherwise, you can uh, direct message myself or Manfred on uh, Twitter. And uh, other than that, uh, music for the show is from uh, the Mega Man 6 gameplay album by Christoph Schlowowski. And if you want to find us, uh, again, hit us up on Twitter or Slack. All right. And uh, after that, remember that for fast data... Uh, for fast data at Resto, Presto is the besto. Thank you, and see you guys later. Hi, everyone.